Welcome to episode number 14 of Let the Ancestors Speak. This evening we're going to be to doing a tour of the Hardeman House Temple Library University. And before we begin our tour, we need to do a libation. And so today we pour a libation for all the maroons in history and all the maroons in us. For all of those who freed themselves, who remain mentally and spiritually unconquered, who remain proud, fiercely proud of their cultural heritage and were unapologetically committed to cultural continuity. For those ancestors we say, Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. I dedicated our libation this evening to the Maroons because those Maroons were those African people who refused to be enslaved and fled into isolated mountainsides and built communities and cities and resisted conquering and invading forces for over decades and decades and decades. And these are people in this time that we need to hear speak. The Hardeman House Temple Library University is a place that rejects the notion of blacks as docile, compliant, submissive, and celebrates the resistance, the rebellion, the resiliency, the creativity, and the leadership of black lives from ancient Egypt to contemporary times. It represents my eclectic college career of jumping from major to major. It reflects my scholarship and my research, and it reflects my interest. Each week I have been, showcase each week I have been show showcasing artifacts from my field work and my travels. And this week I'd like to focus on three artifacts from our Temple Library universe. The first is the OMAC culture of of, of, of Meso, Mesoamerica and um, contemporary Mexico. The second one we're going to talk about is the um, Maroon um, uh, Quilambo uh, community I visited in Northeast Brazil. And the third item that we're going to talk about is a section from a text of a book called Kimmet and the African worldview. Last December, a friend and I went to Mexico in order to study Afro-Mexican culture. We wanted to study from its very beginning with the Olmec heads to what had happened up to contemporary times. And so we went to um, the museum to see the Olmec heads. And the Olmecs, um, this is a very little head. The Olmecs are, are very big. They're some, they, the smallest one is three feet. The highest one is 12 feet. They're very heavy. The smallest one is about six tons. The biggest one is about 50 tons. But this was just a small miniature and I could fit it into my suitcase. Not only did we find out that the Olmecs were considered the mother civilization of Mesoamerica. And we found out that many people believed that the Olmecs had descended from, from um, um, people from Mali who had navigated the Atlantic Ocean long, long ago. In fact, Olmec culture, they say, ranges from 1500 to 500 BC in terms of its beginnings. We also learned that Afro-Mexicans had pivotal roles not only in the birth of Mexico with the Olmecs, but they were prominent in the Mexican independent movement, in Mexican politics, and in the Mexican cultural renaissance movement. Unfortunately, they have often been rejected, very much like their counterparts in the States. But through their struggles and the victories, this year, for the first time, they are going to be counted on the 2020 Mexican census. I learned that Mexico had the second highest number of imported Africans after Brazil. 
I also learned that they did not go gently into the night. For example, there was Gaspar Jenna, who was sometimes called the first liberators of America, who was an enslaved African prince from the Garbon, who was brought over to Mexico, who very quickly, because of his um, um, charismatic nature, nature get, um, got a group of followers together, and as soon as they could, they escaped and ran off into the hills near Veracruz. They were so resourceful that for 30 years, the Spanish could not penetrate the land where they were at. But after 30 years, the Spanish got a little tired of their making their living by, by, by pilfering and robbing people on the highway. And so the Spanish led an assault against Gaspar Genta and his maroon community. But the community was so ferocious that eventually the Spanish gave up and signed a treaty and gave them the land that they occupied. And that town now is an official town named after Jenna right about an hour outside of Veracruz. Here it comes from Salma's collection of photographs and visuals. But when I look at it, it reminds me of my trip to San Luis, Brazil, when I went to visit the Quilambo people, another group of Maroons. The Quilambo people, along with, the, are, along with many other um, Quilambos, have histories of over 250 years of maintaining, surviving, and thriving. Their struggle is continuous because right now they're being, they're being encoached upon by the evangelists, by the government, and by multinational corporations who want to um, steal their land uh, for mining and oil and stripping purposes. But they, are, they, but they have gone to the UN and they are valiantly fighting because they say they will not be removed from their land. And their weapon, which is a weapon I think is important for us today, is collective action and unity. When I talk with one of the elders from the Quilambo community, I ask them, I said, who are your heroes? I was, I was very interested in that. And he said, everyone who resists is a hero. So I said, and who are your leaders? And he said, everyone who sits in the circle. What does it take to be a maroon? What does it take to sustain oneself to struggle for over 250 years? Well, Asa Hilliard, in an article called Pedagogy in Ancient Egypt, in Kemet and the African Worldview talks about the 10 virtues that the ancient Kidmites listed that were necessary for character building. And when I read them as I was trying to pick out which ancestors wanted to speak on this particular episode, they seemed to me really germane to modern times, to our contemporary times, to our pandemics and our trying to make a way out of no way in the midst of this at ever-changing landscape. And so these were the things that all students in the, in the Kemetic Mystery School had to master. And that was one, control of thought. Two, control of action. Three, control of purpose. Four, faith in the master's ability to teach the truth. Five, faith in one's, one's ability to assimilate the truth. Six, faith in oneself to yield the truth. Seven, freedom from resentment under persecution. Let me say that one again. As I've, been try as I've tried to live my life across, according to these principles, this one was the hardest for me. Seven, freedom from resentment from persecution. And then eight, freedom from resentment from wrong. Nine, ability to distinguish right from wrong. And 10, ability to distinguish the real from the unreal. I think if we think about those things and understand that, that, that degree of discipline, that degree of, 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 of control, that degree of discernment, 
that those will be tools that can serve us well as we try to make decisions and try to move humanity forward at this very opportune time. So what the ancestral takeaway is, it's important to know who you are and stay true to your heritage and destiny. It is important to work in community and, in, and understand that it's not about ego, but it's about we go. To understand that it's incredibly important to understand not only the content, but the context and the subtext of any battle one is engaged in. And last, that if one is going to do this work, one has to consistently examine themselves and check themselves out to see are they operating within the values, within the virtues that they declare themselves to embrace. And now it's time for a little reflection on the lessons learned and wisdom earned from 13 weeks of Let the Ancestors Speak. It's time to go a little bit deeper. So for the next four weeks, I will be reflecting and raw examining on some of the concepts and principles that we talked about in season one. I want to say how thoroughly I have enjoyed these past 13 weeks. I've learned a lot and I've had a lot of fun. I'm particularly grateful and thankful for you, you out there who, have, who are watching this and have watched me. To my subscribers, to my viewers, I want to say thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your presence. Seriously, thank you. If there's a question you have, or something about Hardiman House that you'd like to know, please, please, please write us, put something on the comment, put something on the YouTube, send me an email at ancestralartworks1, all one word, at gmail.com. We would really like to know um, your, your feedback. Because remember, the ancestors are a call and response culture. So please, let us know what you'd like to know more about, what you would like to, us to deal with in the upcoming season, any aspect of Hardeman House that you'd like to revisit or visit for the first time. And lastly, I want to give a sincere shout out to my home designer, personal stylist, cinematographer, editor, audio engineer, artist extraordinaire, daughter, Salma Ayers Hardiman, for her multi-generational cultural depth, her creative aesthetic standards, her generosity, and her unapologetic blackness. She is celebrating her birthday July 16th, and I am so honored to have her in my life. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you.